Hi, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work at IBM Power Systems Advanced Technology Support in Europe. In this little movie, we're going to look at running quite an old version of AX 5.2 on a Power 7 machine. And we can do that by some new features that AX supports and running it in a workload partition. This information is taken from the AX 7 announcement. At the same time, we announced another product called AX 5.2 Workload Partitions for AX 7 version 1.1. I include the feature code there that helps IBMers look up how to order it and how much it costs. We're told that it requires both AX 7 and Power 7 to run. No other combination is allowed. This gives us a runtime environment of AX 5.2 this particular release in the workload partitions environment has been out since AIX6, so that's been out a few years now. This gives us an excellent simple migration path for these older workloads running on older machines into a modern AIX and the very latest uh, hardware. We simply need to create a Mexis B on our old machine, pull it over to our Power 7 machine, we can then create a workload partition to run it. Also, note that we can still do live application mobility between machines. Uh, that is a feature that comes with a separate product, the Workload Partitions Manager, and that's still true. Now, a few little things about history of AX 5.2, because we are going in computer terms way back in history. It actually came out in October 2002 and was aimed at the Power 4 machines that were available at the time. Two years later, note that the next release, AX 5.3, came out, and that was targeted at the Power 5 machines, making sure that it could use all the latest features available with that new processor and the new machines and firmware. Where AX 5.2 couldn't actually fully use a Power 5 machine, it could run but not fully use it. The following two years, it became functionally stabilised. That's an IBM term for we stopped doing prime new function improvements to an operating system. It goes into uh, bug fixes and security fixes being installed. And at that point, X5.3 was where the major new functions were added. The last technology level, TL10, came out in June 2007. And then quite a long time after that, in mid 2008 it was withdrawn from marketing at that point you can't actually buy a copy of 5.2 then I actually noted that the very last service pack the last wrapping up of all the uh, bugs and security fixes was actually quite late it was at uh, mid 2009 I'm actually amazed that we were still doing that for that older version of AIX but we still find, even though this came out, what is it, eight or nine years ago, that a lot of people are still running AX 5.2. There's that old computer term of it ain't broke, don't go fixing it. And to actually upgrade to a newer version of AIX does take quite a lot of work. You have to plan it, you have to do it, you have to retest. You may actually require new versions of the middleware and the application that you may or may not be able to get hold of. So what this product offers is you can run the same copy of AX, the same middleware and the same application versions, but in a new environment on a AX7 running on top of a Power7 machine. Once you've moved your applications off these older machines, you can simply remove them from your computer center. That will save you costs for electricity, heating and cooling. That will free up either floor space for these big old machines or rack space for some of the smaller ones and you'll be able to stop the hardware maintenance. And let's face it, if you've been running these machines for eight or nine years, it's going to be difficult to actually get the spare parts even for them. When you've moved it onto a Power 7 machine, of course, you can expect quite a big performance boost, and that could be very useful. Or you could look at it the other way, you actually reduce the number of CPUs because it's Power 7, and that may actually reduce your software license costs. And to try out this technology, we had to create a Mexis B for AX 5.2. And it was a bit of a shock to the system because we take for granted what we have available these days. We have to think back to what it was like in those Power 4 days. So there's no shared CPUs. You have to allocate a whole dedicated CPU. There's dedicated adapters and no VIO support. So with no virtual disks and no virtual networks. 
no SMT was available, that came in with Power 5, and uh, no DVDs, uh, it's all CD drives, um, and no virtual optical either. You can boot off a physical CD drive, probably a SCSI one, uh, or you can still do a NIM install, and that's in fact how we did it. This same feature is often called versioned WPARs. You might find that, for example, in the documentation or white papers. It's a little hint there that other versions of AX may be using this method of being supported inside a WPAR. I often get asked, does that mean some of the older, even older versions of AX are going to be supported? And the answer for that is probably no. It's more than likely that if we do support another version, it will be AX 5.3 that we'll be going for, as that's a much easier target, and there'll be a lot of customers using that particular version. Also note that we're only going to support AX 5.2 Technology Level 10 Service Pack 8. This is explicitly checked for when you do the creation of the workload partition. Now you've got to ask yourself, is that a problem? Well, the updates to this level are still available on uh, Fix Central, and you can update your copy of AX to this level if you haven't done already. As this has been functionally stable for a long time, many years now, it would have been a good move to actually be at this level anyway because you'll have the maximum number of bug fixes and security fixes um, in your old copy of AIX. Also note that the AX 5.2 install media is not going to be provided as part of this product. We are not going to encourage people to do a fresh install of AX 5.2 at this stage of the game. This is a product for people already running AX 5.2 and want to move up to the latest versions of the hardware. Now as you run this AX 5.2 in a WPAR, some of the new features that are available that are sitting underneath the WPAR actually become available too. For example, the virtual I.O. server will become available, so you could be running this WPAR on virtual disks over virtual networks. The SMT4 that we have with Power 7 gives us a speed boost, and that is available. As far as AX 5.2 is concerned, you just seem to have a lot of CPUs. Also, AX 7 could be using the AME, the Active Memory Expansion, and by compressing memory to make better use of memory under the covers. The WPAR will be unaware of these things going on. Also, because the WPAR only sees file systems as opposed to the real disks in the machine, the WPAR can be supported by newer disks, things that it's never seen before, like SAS disks or solid-state disks are now available, can be underlying uh, WPARs. Uh, DVD drives, for example, even 10 gigabit Ethernet wasn't invented at the time, and certainly not the 8 gigabyte fiber channel adapters. So all of that can actually be supported. The WPAR will not actually know that that's underneath the covers. So I'd just like to point out that the base WPAR functions come with AX6 or 7, and that gives you command line access but no mobility. If you want this extra AX5.2, then it's an extra product that you need to purchase. And if you buy the Workload Partition Manager, which is a Systems Director plugin now, that's when you get the mobility features, you get the graphical user interfaces, and it will understand the workload partitions for AX5.2 from the release 221, which I'm told is coming out in September. So how do we get this all running? Well, you've got to get up to that latest version of 5.2. You've got to take a makes B of your root volume group. A lot of people do that anyway as a good way of backing the system up. You need to back up your other volume groups, perhaps your database or your application data. You copy all that to your new copy of the AIX7 running on Power7, your global copy of AIX. Then you add a package for the version WPARs, that gives you the uh, new support. Then you run the make WPAR command, just as before, but you have two more options. The minus C pulls in these extra packages for AX5.2. And the minus B is just a way of pointing towards the makes this B file involved. You can then run this as a WPAR like you can before, and particularly adding the other file systems to bring in the perhaps the database files or the application data. There's also an extra option to the LSWPAR command, minus T for type, and capital L gives you these legacy WPARs. Well, that's more than enough talking. Let's go and have a look at what it's like. We've already got AX7 installed on Power7 machine. We need to install this VWPAR 
package includes these uh, four items. We also need that AX 5.2 makes his B available. And then we can create the W part and we'll have a look around inside. Okay, so I'm on my Power 7 machine. It's a Power 750 and I'm running AX 7. And we're in the directory with these new VWPAR packages. I'm going to install those using good old Smitty. Current directory. Better pop down and accept new licenses. Or it may give me error messages and refuse to do that. Okay. We pop down here. We can see here's the... Uh, Stuff selected and the all in successfully. Okay. Now we can use the lslpp command to go and find those. Let's find all the WPAR packages. So here's the boss WPARs, that's what comes with the AX itself, and here's the other VWPAR commands. Let's clear the screen. I have a file here with the command for the make w par. That minus n is the name, that's normal. The middle line there is the minus capital C and the minus capital B. The make sys b here is on my NFS repository. The last line is the, the standard stuff for the uh, host name and network details. So we'll just run that. It's creating the various file systems. Now it's pulling in the details from the makes B, I think. I'll pull in another window here and we can see if we use the df command that it's mounted all these file systems at the bottom here. And they should be uh, slowly filling up with slash user at the moment, this one here, it's 12%, uh, run that again, there we are, it's 18%, so it's filling up rapidly. Okay, there we go. It took um, about 12 minutes to do that. I'm thinking when I was sitting here that perhaps I'm doing it over NFS and if I did it on local disks, that could be quite a bit faster. Anyway, all looks good. Um, it actually gives us a clue down here what to do to actually start it up. Okay, clear the screen and we'll start it up. Nice and quick. Over the file systems, here we go. And we can see the regular ones for opt, temp, user, var, and home, and uh, root file system. We actually see a couple of extra ones in here. And these are mounted on top of the AIX7 opt, sbin, and user. Haven't seen these before, so. I assume these are some way of the WPAR to get access to these file systems which will be having the AOX7 version of a lot of the commands. OK, let's clear the decks and we'll do LSWPAR and we see we have three WPARs WP15 and 14 are active and WP13 is just defined. And um, if we do the same command but with a minus T L, we'll see that 13 and 15 are these versions of WPARS, uh, because WPAR 14 is just a regular AX7 workload partition. Okay, now let's do um, telnet into 15. Um, we could use cLogin to get into there, but I do like to emphasize don't use C login because um, things that you start there, particularly background processes, for example, and services, uh, will not survive mobility. 
that um, if we turn it into it, okay, it looks like any other machine, and we'll use a root to get into there. And this is exactly as we did it with the Makes B. You notice there was no password. That's because when we do Makes This piece, we delete the password uh, before we actually make it and put it back afterwards. That means we can't forget the root password if we ever need to recover it. Okay, um, now let's uh, just check a few things. Host name, as you'd expect. Uh, we better change the prompt here. That's not going to work very long, is it? So, um, that's the host name that we captured the workload from. There we go, let's hard code it in here. So, what should we uh, call this? Uh, VWPAR WP15. Okay. Yeah, that looks better. Okay. A um, couple of other things in here. Um, IF config minus A. That looks exactly as it does with a regular workload partition. So, here is our, it looks like our. Um, Ethernet adapter is actually an alias on the global copy of AIX. Um, all this OS level minus S. Yep, we're running 5.2, TL10, service pack 8, and that became available on the 30th week of 2009. Okay, let's try um, LS config and see what we can find about a machine. Okay, so some things don't work. The serial number doesn't work. That, that's And there's some other bits and pieces in here. That's standard for workload partitions, but um, yep, we can actually see that it's a Power 7 machine that we're running on. Okay, it was 64-bit. Uh, don't worry about this. This is the, the name of our logical partition and its number. Um, I just tend to put in the, uh, in the name of the logical partition the AIX release we're running in here. Some memory. Um, yep, we can see that this is a, a Power 7 machine uh, as well. Uh, we've got some paging space in here. And if we carry on going, yep, we've got no resources because we don't have disks normally inside a regular workload partition unless we've assigned adapters into it. Okay, what else have we got in here? We've got uh, uh, LS. User, so here we have the slash user from X 5.2. Now, I don't want to go and prove that by logging on to a, an old AX 5.2 machine. Um, if we look at the, um, the disk defined inside our machine, here's the mount points for these NREs. Uh, not sure what NRE, uh, runtime environment, something new runtime environment, we don't know. Uh, maybe Nigel's runtime environment, but I don't think it is. Um, if we actually go in here, though, and have a look in here, let's get this back up, and then the new one, we'll see that they are quite different, and you'll notice that this has the uh, X11R7, that appeared first in uh, AIX6. So I'm pretty sure that this is the uh, user file system in the AIX7 global copy of AIX and it's mounted read only as we saw when we were looking um, externally. Um, PS minus F, I don't know sufficiently well if there's any differences there between AX52 and AX7. Um, oh, so I look at some performance numbers. Topaz. Oh well, 5.2 never had the Topaz command. Uh, that's a bit of a, of a shame. Um, I did notice that if, of course, you go to here, there is a topaz there, so perhaps we could run that. Ah, no, we can't. We're running AX 5.2, and that's requiring libraries that uh, are not present, so we can't run AX 7 commands in this environment. Okay, so I'll need to go and get a copy of uh, Enmon Classic if I want some of those performance uh, numbers. Okay, so let me quickly uh, do that. You don't have to watch this bit. So while you weren't looking, I went and got the latest copy of AIX Classic for AX 5.2. Here it is. We'll start it up and we'll look at the CPUs. Now, there isn't a lot of point in looking at the performance inside a WPAR, we need to look at the global level 
but we can see there's very little work going on here so there's not much to look at the individual CPUs it doesn't understand threads so it just sees them as a whole group of uh, CPUs here's the memory it's looking at a global copy of uh, memory so it sees all four gigabytes uh, network as as you'd expect and disks well, it can't see any. OK, let's look at the global level of uh, AX. Now, monitoring performance inside a double part doesn't make a lot of sense because you have to find out what the global copy of AX is doing to understand what's going on. So we're back at the global level here, and um, perhaps we're going to try the Utopaz Enmon uh, here. And I'll put in the, uh, the at sign, and we have the workload partitions. We can see... 14 and 15 are running here, 13 is just defined, so it's not switched on at the moment. And if we do a capital W, we can see the workload partition manager. These are all the defaults in here, the shares haven't been set, but you can see what's going on. Um, interestingly, the workload partitions here, this is a regular one, it's gone down since AX6, so they've done some work in here, and... Uh, a W pass coming in at 26 megabytes of memory. That's uh, quite amazing. And uh, we've got 54 megabytes in use here for the uh, versioned workload partition with AX 5.2 in it. And it's using some space in NumPerm. Remember, it's got a different uh, file systems it's having to load, so it's taking more of the file system cache. But again, that's small. I mean, combined, that's well under 100 megabytes of uh, memory because we've just started it up and only run a few little commands. But uh, the default, the, the base amount of memory used by a workload partition of either type is very small compared to AIX, which typically comes in at about a gigabyte to get you going. Now, if you flip into the Topaz mode, you can see here it's uh, switched on the workload management classes in here. If we hit uh, capital W, we go to the right mode and hit an ampersand as well. And here's our W pass. Uh, we can see the percentage of memory being used in here. I've got uh, 4 gigabytes of memory in this partition. And uh, we can actually do things like if we go down to a particular workload partition and hit F, we'll see that the processes down the bottom here are now the processes being used by that particular workload partition. If you go back up and hit F, these are the processes back at the global copy of AIX. Well, I hope that's given you an idea of what it's like to run a workload partition with AX 5.2 in it. Before we finish then, I want to tell you a little bit about how they've actually managed to get this environment to work. First note, there's no virtualization or emulation layer involved in here. Everything will be expected to work at full speed. They analysed the two kernels and we found that there were 13 system calls that needed adjustment. Perhaps the later versions of AIX have extra parameters available to system calls and so those system calls are adjusted when we're in this environment so that they'll work as expected. Then they compared the system level commands that understand something about the kernel itself and found that there are roughly 300 commands that actually would be aware of the fact that the kernel underneath has changed. So they've gone through all of those commands and made special versions of those that will run in this 5.2 environment but on top of an AX7 kernel. These new versions of these commands, when you actually do the install of AX5.2, it goes into the private slash user, and these commands then are overwritten or fixed up as part of the installation. Also note that AX5.2 has no clues about new features or commands in later versions of AIX. And because those commands and libraries won't appear in the slash user for the workload partition, we won't have access to those. So AX5.2 isn't going to get confused because the kernel underneath can do a whole lot more that it's unaware of. Also point out that there's some deep kernel level things that they've also got support for. Uh, there are some kernel extensions in AIX, there's never been very many, but just because you've got some, don't rule out this version WPAR environment. Some of those will be actually supported. Some performance tools are an example of commands that perhaps come from third parties that actually use the dev kmem method of getting data straight out of the kernel. And the top 25 popular symbols that they look for in the 
the simple table are actually supported so they will actually still work even though there's a different kernel underneath. Also we have the feature of being able to add PTFs and interim fixes so if you've got some of those above the TL10 service pack 8 you can still apply those even in this environment which to be honest is quite impressive. Well that concludes our quick look at version WPAS running AX 5.2. I hope you found that interesting. If you didn't get the movie from this website then the high resolution is available here and you might find it easy to see what was on the screen as we were going. On this website is another 80 movies or so and a whole load of interesting technology.